Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit, lit. Check it, check it, check it. This is a unique house. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not, not you know, my dad walk on. Hey, man. Hey, man. We down here, man, in Chicago, man. And, uh, you know, this guy right here, you know, he's a native of Chicago. Yes. And this guy right here really don't need no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He's 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 trying Why to. Do he? Well, we don't. We gonna see. <laughs> Man, Mr. Andre Nero, President Andre Nero. President elect Andre, Andre Nero. Nero. I love it. How you doing, man? I am phenomenal. I appreciate being here and I appreciate the invite. Thank you, guys. Man, hey, man, just a breath of fresh air, man, to get down here into your city. This your city. So at the end of the day, you know, I hear a lot of things, man. And uh, you know, so I when I when I got here, I took my jury in. You know, I got a little jury under here, but I put <laughs> it up because I say, you know, what these guys down here, they may not have no jury. I don't know. Remember we went to Miami. I kind of mm -hmm. did the same thing. Kind of tucked it a little in bit. In Jamaica, you just I don't don't, don't tuck it. You just in don't Jamaica, take, just don't put it on. Just leave it at home. <laughs> I don't wear jewelry no more. No more. Yeah. So man, just tell us, man. We like to go back, right? Yes. We, we like to get into your backstory. Being from what part of Chicago are you from originally? So I was originally born on the west side of Chicago, about one block away from the original Bull Stadium. And we were poor growing up, so we moved around a lot of times. Wow, y'all yeah. raised you, you, with your mother and father? No, my uh, my as they would say, you, you know, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Mm. Uh, we laid him to rest a few years ago, uh, but his his presence wasn't there. You know, uh, matter of fact, if I always tell people if he was in my life consistently, consistently, then I would probably be the first president with Jerry Curls. <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 when I look at just you say you was poor you know I was poor so I don't know what your poor is but project poor oh. I'm talking about syrup sandwich uh, one slice of bread maybe the, the that first piece poor like so maybe these names will ring a bell Cabrini Green okay. are their gardens. Uh, of course, and then we transitioned over to uh, 79th and Halstead, 55th and University, uh, Blue Island, Park Forest, Dalton, Riverdale. So we moved around a lot. And I always, you know, up until I was probably maybe eight, I thought my mom was a, I thought she was a doctor because she had the, the white uniform she would come mm. home with and she had an additional job, which didn't make sense to me. Uh, but she was also working as a cafeteria worker in a, in a school. Uh, and it wasn't until I got older to realize that she wasn't a doctor. She was a CNA. Wow. Wow. Uh, which is a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I started working a newspaper job. Uh, started at six years old. So I've always had a job uh, in sales. At six years old. So who instilled that into you? Um, the, the work ethic? Like get up and let's try to make some money. Well, my mom is a, I guess you would say, and it's, this is fitting, a silent hustler. Okay. Uh, my mom was never one of those individuals that would tell you what she's going through. And if I wasn't her son, I wouldn't have known she was going through anything. Uh, she was one who always kept her game face and her composure in public and would break down in private. Um, and over the course of hearing her, you know, cry behind the wall a few times, I, you know, started to piece together what the issue was. And at six plus, years old. At six years wow. old. Yeah, six years old. And then also too, you know, realizing some days we didn't, we would go without eating. Mm. Um, so of course, you know, one plus one is always two. So over the course of some time, I was like, mom, I got a job, you know, she's like, what, you know? Uh, so whenever it happened, I started working for the Chicago Tribune, the Daily Star, uh, and South Town Economist. Are you the only child? I'm not. I have two brothers. I have one younger, one older. How much older? My older brother is two years older than me. Okay. So did was he working as well too? Did he? Because you know all the kids are different. You always yeah, have that he, one that's a little bit more responsible. He was the suave one. He was okay the one, into the girls. You know, yeah, he was the cool one. <laughs> uh, I was I was the one that took took after my mom. Uh, when my mom worried, I worried. But okay. I, I had more of a composure about it. But I still worried the same because I was I was the nosy one too. Uh, when the bills came in, I, you know, I grabbed all the envelopes and mm. seeing was what, and trying to grab a calculator. You know, it was Texas Instrument at that time. Mm. Yes, I remember. Those and days. I would try to calculate things, and then based on what, you know, I was seeing my mom paychecks, and it wasn't enough for a doctor because I thought she was a doctor. Right. I'm like, man, they ripping her off. So and she didn't hide these things from you. So no, I was just nosy. nosy. She had a drawer, an old, old, like a. Um, 
a mahogany dresser, a mahogany dresser uh, that had a little key thing. And I kind of picked the lock, you know, it was like a little mm -hmm. dresser she had. She tried to hide all this, those things from us. And because I was piecing it together, you know, with no food in the refrigerator, things like that, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go work. And I did just that, you know, snuck out, you know, one day went to uh, one of the newspaper companies or whatever, talked to this guy named Mr. Henry, never forget it. And he was like, you know, Andre, you want a job? And I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, well, everybody around here, we do hard labor. You six years old, you don't know nothing about hard labor. <laughs> I was like, but I'm willing to learn. And did that. Uh, I actually did it for four years before I got promoted. I got my first management job with this newspaper company at 10 years old managing adults. Mm. Wow. And I stayed with them a total of two How years. How hard was that? Because I remember working in an accounting firm and... I was the youngest person, so everybody looked at me like, what do you know? How can you tell me? Well, honestly, I was one of those happy-go-lucky kids. So it wasn't a problem too big, and it wasn't a problem too, too small that couldn't be solved. I'm a problem solver. If I see okay. an issue, I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell you about the problem too many times. I'm going to identify what the issue is. We're going to talk about it, and if you don't come up with a solution, I'm going to exit you out, and I'm going to find a solution myself. And that's basically what I do. Has there ever been a problem that you couldn't solve? Every so often I may run into an issue that requires more than just me to solve it. Okay. Which brings us to today's circumstance. Right. Yeah. But before we get all into that, let's um, keep up with your the so, background. The background a little mm -hmm. bit more. So, um, single mom growing up, but did you ever have any male influence in your life? So, there was a, a pastor uh, that was a... Uh, a very intrinsic part of our lives. He was our godfather. Uh, so we grew up in church, you know, just like everybody in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I grew up in church, you know, we, uh, my mom literally whooped me into singing. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't hold a note up until I was like five years old and one day I was like in her closet because she, she's one of the baddest organists in the state of, really? of Illinois. Yeah. Um, so she has played for a lot of churches in the city of Chicago. Uh, and then when she discovered that I could hold a note, she stopped singing and made me sing. <laughs> As well as direct <laughs> choirs and some other right. things or whatever. Uh, but that didn't change the financial, you know, situation mm -hmm. because, you know, anybody that know a thing about churches, they don't really pay in churches right. either. Not that, that they can't afford it, they just don't pay, you know. Uh, that's a livable per se. No, the thing I, I, I just uh, look at, man, coming up in the inner city, uh, being one that was coming out of uh, poverty situations, were you ever bullied as a kid? Did he, yeah, they run you in the house, them boys did, or what? So my mom tells me that I was a thick child. Okay. Mm. And, uh, you know, um, my label uh, during those times, I was labeled as choir boy. <laughs> You know, choir boy or, or preacher boy, and I'm gonna tell you a fun fact. I actually asked to join a gang, and they laughed at me and told me that I was like, "No, nah, you just keep praying for us or whatever you do, <laughs> <laughs> but let us do what we do." And I, I literally begged. I'm like, "Please, please, please! Like, I'll be the best gang member you ever saw." No. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> it's like, they it's don't like, want you because that's your environment and that's what you saw around yeah. you. Yeah. Well, so I'll tell you my mindset at that time. Uh, my mindset was camaraderie. Again, I didn't really technically have a father figure or male role model. And the men that I did see was in the game. Yeah, yeah. So my assumption was, is that if I got connected to with, with them, that I would have the male figure that I yeah. needed mm -hmm. to do, you know, to continue to elevate, to elevate mm -hmm. and grow up in, in life. Man. Uh, so I'm actually really fortunate that they didn't allow me to do that. Um, I will tell you, you know, they could have because these hands do work. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't used them in a, in a while. Uh, but, but I love the, the fact that you said it because to me, when, when I hear that, all I can think about is the present right now and how many other young kids right now feel that oh, way. Ugh. I knew it. Absolutely. Still, I'm sorry. I want to apologize. That was me. You know you usually take the phone from me. I can't deal with these electronics. <laughs> I'm turning it off right now. All right, let's go. So um, what I was saying is that um, it, in today's present time, how many other young kids feel that way? Um, because that's why these gangs keep growing and growing and growing because father figures are not there. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for that camaraderie. They're looking for that male role model that can help them get somewhere in life, that can help them feed their family. Because that's the reason why a lot of young men end up doing these things because they have bills to pay, they have people to support so 
but how can we, you know, not have that mentality? In real time, you know, there's a difference between, I guess you would say, us and them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not been given a decent advantage uh, as it relates to our households, our, our median living income, um, the unification in family. You know, a lot of us haven't had the opportunity to grow in a two-parent household. Mm -hmm. And very rarely you see that. And of course, there's some uh, admiration for those type of families, but statistically it's very difficult for us because we're used to the status quo, so to speak. Right. Um, so of course you would gravitate to those things that would seem like it has that foundation or that solidification to validate you as a man. And unfortunately there are many, many cultured women that has no choice but to uh, raise their children on their own. Uh, and what makes it worse is if they left to raise their children without any financial support as well. Uh, it's one thing to have that emotional support and the physical support, but then when the financial support part is taken away from it, it makes things extremely difficult. Uh, so I guess you would say that that was most of the, the influence of my decision of wanting to be a part uh, because I felt like if I had been accepted into that, mm -hmm. that part would have gone away. Yeah, and that's so that's so true because we've been doing this podcast for a little bit over a year and a lot of the I want to say almost 80% of the individuals who sit here are have been raised by single mothers. Um whether the father was a rolling stone or they just left mm -hmm. or you know they don't know them or yeah. they passed away or just different things like that, but a couple of them ended up having some sort of male role model, maybe an uncle stepped in or grandfather stepped in. So they were blessed where they had that, but there's nothing like having your father, you know, there especially if he um is positive. And that's one thing I can never understand is how cuz for boys I always feel like when you reach a certain age, you need your father to teach you how to become a man. So even if you're in separate households, I feel like the boy needs to go with the father. You know, it's funny you mentioned that I actually just did a conference. It was a, actually, no, it was a father-daughter dance in Minnesota. And I was the keynote speaker there. And I had the pleasure of talking to over 600 fathers. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know, you know, we can run stats and figures all day long. I can do that, and that's not a problem. But one thing I did notice that there was a fair mix, 50-50, of birth fathers and men that stood in the gap. Mm. And it, I didn't have a choice but to shed tears because I, was, I wasn't nervous. I'm never nervous. I'm from, I'm from here. So, right. you know, uh, yeah, David you know. Chappelle said it best. Chicago does not have a scared people. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it touched my heart in such a way to see in one room we had 600 men that was willing to either A, be the father to their children, or B, be the person in between or standing in a gap for that person. Mm -hmm. And to see it head on, it just, everything just rushed me all the time. <coughs> now I do have someone that I call my dad and he's been my dad for the last 23 years. Um, and how we met is, is probably even more of a remarkable story. Matter of fact, I might write a book about that by itself. Mm. Um, so, but to see someone that can take someone that is not their blood mm -hmm. and make them your blood speaks volumes to you as a male, as a man. And that's what the world needs to see more of, especially here in the United States. How old were you when he stepped in as a father role in your life? Uh, I was 19 years old. So how receiving were you at that time to receive a man who wasn't biologically your father to play it, that role? It took a minute, but I'll, I'll tell you what he did that, that stood out to me. Okay. Uh, I was I actually got in legal trouble. I had to get locked up. Okay. Uh, uh, because I was getting ready to marry a young lady, um, and we was together six years, and she at never. At nineteen? No, yeah, at nineteen. We was together from thirteen to nineteen. Wow. And we were getting ready to get married, and we had everything, you know, done. I was, you know, our wedding was at seven p.m. that night, oh. and she never showed up. And I found out a week later that she had married another guy the same huh? day. 
and he was a pastor. So hold on. Yeah, that's a whole nother <laughs> story. Stuff right stuff. There. Now, that's, what yeah. this, that's what this podcast wow. is about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just said it right yeah. then. That was it right there. Uh, I, I wrote a whole book about it. That's like I, I have an autobiography of my life, and that's again, that's how I, that's how I'm sitting in a seat today. How did you find out a week later? Who told you? She told me. She told you. She told me. Um, I was actually at the church, and I got. And you a, kept calling, and she wouldn't answer. No, no. Uh, well, the, back back in the nineties, there wasn't no calling. <laughs> yeah, up. yeah. We didn't have cell, <laughs> cell phones. phones. <laughs> you know, we had pages. You you hit the page, and you go to the paper, and hope that's the person you're looking for. Um, but what I did was, you know, the pastor of the church that we attended. He was mm-hmm. an old guy. You know, he he has passed as well, and we were both members of that uh, church, and uh, I couldn't face the reality of what just happened. Uh, so I asked, we were actually building the, uh, extending the choir stand because the way that it was that we was basically packed on, uh, with one another. So we extended it out. So I asked him if I can actually stay in the church and continue building by myself. When mm-hmm. I tell you I was angry, I was bitter. So you took all of that out I into took it building. Into building. I Which was is ta- grabbing a drywall with one hand and just climbing <laughs> up the ladder and just, ta, ta, you know. Uh, and then the phone literally rang at midnight and something in me just told me that it was her. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just so happened to say, you know, I, all of her was background. Matter of fact, uh, she was calling me from 55th in Indiana right wow. down the street. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I can hear the car zooming past and I was like, hey, you know, if you were going to marry somebody else. And I was guessing. I had no idea that I was hitting the nail on the head. I said, hey, if you would be on to marry somebody else, so you could at least invite me, you know, to the wedding based on our history, blah, blah, blah. And I started laughing. And then she said, how did you know? <laughs> wow. So I didn't know. I was just. And hold on. Know, at that moment, you weren't on the ladder, right? When you were talking. No, to I wasn't on the ladder. Okay. I, I, I pretty much worked myself to exhaustion. And I went inside in the, okay. in the office. Luckily. Luckily. And I was sitting in like a little uh rocking chair like a leather Mm -hmm. you know comfortable rocking chair and you were there by yourself i was there by myself because i asked the pastor if i can stay everybody else was gone like i didn't even want to see my mama you know Mm -hmm. i know she had to leave she left early she's like andre uh you know i love you but i can't stay here and watch you go through this right and um and so she left uh my mom has wrestled with with a bunch of illnesses over the course of some years and she's gained a lot of weight and she Mm -hmm. just recently lost it too okay awesome uh, a bulk of it so so I haven't seen her at this size since I was a teenager. So I'm really, really excited about that, you know, but she walked out and I think that affected me more than anything else because to be able to look your son in the eye and say, you know, like, I can't stomach this any, anymore. Like, I don't think she's going to show. You can stay if you want to, but I just got a bad feeling. I just feel like she's not going to show up and I can't sit through this. And she, she walked out on me and at that point i'm 19 years old you know i'm feeling like my mama walked out on me you know that's mm-hmm. that's the feeling uh, and it was very emotional it was, it was a lot of you know uh emotional events happening all at one time and that goes into an even deeper story but she never showed it you know more story and but she ended up coming back with me a week later uh one thing led to another so on the phone after you finished that phone call and she told you that. What did you do? So when she said that, I, I was I was stunned. Of course, I mm-hmm. kind of hit the seat. Like you know, what's going on with this? Um, and then I was like, and I asked her, "Did you do you love me?" And she's like, "You know, I do." Now again, like I said, this story is really really deep. And like I said, I wrote the book details. What's the name every, of the book? It's called "Changed at the Altar." Okay. The Andre Nero story. Okay. Uh, I saw that, and I was like, figuring I'm, I'm, with the title, I'm like, okay, maybe you were into some bad dealings and then you change your life at the altar. Cause when I, I wasn't thinking about wedding for some reason. I was just thinking about you giving up your life to Christ. That's what I was thinking about with that. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely not. Um, in some ways, I wish that was the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reality, so you know how you can take a negative situation mm-hmm. and it can be converted to something so positive. Uh And in reality, that's what happened. So in the midst of travesty, I developed triumph. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot of different uh, things that were in turn of events to to develop and shape the person that you're looking at today. But I would not be who I am today without that situation. Without that situation. 
give me the soul. That's why the book was called, called, entitled Changed at the Altar, right. because my entire life was changed because I went to jail as a result of I went to prison as a result of I went I was in for two years. Like my my I know I know my ID number by heart. So being a 19 year old. Uh, so what did you do to get? So that's what I'm trying to get to. So now. what ended up happening, like she ended up coming back with me a week later. Uh, and I don't want to get into the detail, detail That's of it, fine. but the meat of it is, is that she came back with me. The pastor that she did marry, didn't like it, sent a couple of his goon cousins to my mom's house, broke in the house. They put their hands on my mom and, uh, and, wow. and end up. So what by me working so much and I was a manager and I was giving her money every week, didn't know she had a joint account with her mom. Um, I had made a Valentine's day card, right? at the church that we were at, and I put it on the door. It was almost as big as this uh, this sign. Wow. And it was custom, and then, you know, we only had poster boards and stencils. Mm -hmm. So I made a customized Valentine's Day thing because the wedding was in a couple of months. So everybody knows Valentine's Day, February 14th. And a couple So y'all were gonna get married again? No, no, we were going to get married. Okay, so, so the Valentine's Day right. card okay. situation well, before, okay. happened a couple of months before okay, the wedding. Cool. Okay. Now, so this thing gets deep. Uh, what ended up happening is that I didn't know that the mom was, I was a new member at the church. I actually just joined that year. That was 1999. Okay. I had just joined. And again, mind you, I'm, I'm putting money in her account. My, this is my fiance. This is, mm -hmm. you know, the love of my life. I'm putting money in her account every paycheck. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is that as me being a new member, I asked the pastor of the church if it was okay to put this, you know, post on the board. Now, I didn't know that the mom was lying for years about who her father was. Oh. So what I did was I put her real last name on the, the Valentine's Day card. Mm -hmm. The, uh, okay, again, like I said, it's deep. The mother, her mother was the assistant first lady of the church, which her stepfather was the assistant Don't pastor. tell me the, 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 the father is the pastor. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the stepfather is, is the, was the assistant pastor okay. of the church. So when I made this card, everybody's asking this question, Andre, this card is amazing, just another blah, blah, blah. But, but who name. is, you know, who is this person? And I'm thinking they had gotten jokes because at the end of the day, they seen me three times a week. So I'm like, I know y'all joking. So when the stepfather come in, AKA the assistant pastor, he loved it. He was like, Andre, this is very creative. I wish I had some of the, you know, creative, you know, ingenuity that mm -hmm. you had, you know, at your age. Um, and then when my ex-fiance came in, she was excited, she crying and everything, but when the mom came in, she yelled my name from the front of the church, because we was in the back of the church. And then um, I went to the front, and then of course her husband and you know my ex-fiance my fiance at the time, mm -hmm. we rushed to the front, like what's, going, what's on? going on? So she grabbed me by my arm and threw me into the pastor's office and cussed me clean out. Mm. And told me how dare you try to cause, you know, uh, a division with my family, just another in this church. They've known about his name for so long, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Still, I didn't know what was going on. And um, and halfway through her cussing me out, I realized, oh, she must be talking about me using her the name that I've always known. She never told me that she was lying. And, you know, sometimes right. you roll with the punches, things like that or whatever. And But nobody said anything. Mm -hmm. But I guess you didn't anticipate me putting this life-size uh, balance right. as a post on, <laughs> uh, on a thing at the same time. Uh, so at that point, she made a vow to me and she promised me, she said, you will not marry my daughter. Things, that's when things started to shift. So me and her, if you've seen one, you've seen the other, similar to how you guys' relationship is. You, saw, you see one, you see the other. Uh, so things started slowly, well, no, not slowly, quickly transitioning into now we got to move the wedding date up mm -hmm. because now this has the potential of getting right you know, a mm -hmm. little dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. So now my mindset is I got to save her. And because she wasn't one to really speak up for herself, I was the voice box for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm a natural born leader. So what I do is I protect people. I'm, you know, if, if something needs to be said and saying it diplomatically where people can understand what we're talking about, I was a person who said it for both of us. And we liked it that way. That was, mm -hmm. you know, um, but then after that, you know, she told me, you know, you know, she had to drop me off. You know, folks coming up missing all the time. So things just got really crazy. And I'm thinking this is in the church world, you know. So most of the things that I've dealt with is in dealing the with the church. church right. Uh, and I understand why people have difficulty 
being a part of a church mm -hmm. for similar reasons, you know, it may not be as... Um, it's not transparent. It's, it's a lot of hypocrisy. Hypo exactly. A lot of hypocrisy. So, uh, so I can understand it from every angle. I can understand it from a street angle. I can understand it from a church angle. I can understand it from a, I guess you say, a diplomatic right. angle. So there's no area that I can't touch. But like I said, the gratefulness come in is because I can understand it from every single level. But those things are the things that made me who I am right now. So I don't, I can't even imagine what my life would be like if those situations didn't happen. So now fast forward and you know, with the situation, I end up doing two years. So in the state of Illinois, when it's a nonviolent crime, uh, I actually got charged with residential burglary and commercial burglary. And the reason that is, is because when the, the guy sent his cousins, his, right. you know, to, to your mom's house. So I actually went to get a, a gun. I broke mm -hmm. in one of my, one of my guy's house and I knew it was a pearl handle Smith and Wesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm from Chicago, so we was going to do what we do in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, that did not happen. So now I'm thinking about the money that was taken because they've taken over $10,000 of the money that I had given her out of that account. Her mom did that. And so when I, I ended up breaking into the house, so my original thing was to, okay, so since you want to change my life, let me change yours. And fortunately, he was not there. So now I'm thinking about the money that was taken. So now I'm looking for seeing if you got some money because mm -hmm. now I need to recover what, what was taken. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the business and it triggered off a silent alarm. My saving grace is that I put the gun in the car right after I broke into his business. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for, you know, the cash register to see if I can, you know, if I'm looking for the $10,000. Right. Um, and I didn't find anything. And I was so out of it. I was literally up over 21 hours, and I had to work three full-time jobs. So I was working at McDonald's as a manager. I was working Popeye's out as a manager. So when I leave from one, I would leave to the next, and then I had a construction job on the weekends to try to recover the job. Right. So now that we was together, I, I couldn't spend any time with her or anything like that because we had to recoup these finances. Mm -hmm. So the crazy part about this story is that as me being a manager of McDonald's for numerous years, I was the fastest promoted manager that McDonald's has ever had. I got promoted wow. in one week, never having any experience in McDonald's one whatsoever. Week. In one week. Wow. They offered to they offered and bought out the house behind the South Holland McDonald's, mm -hmm. uh, South Holland McDonald's, and they started training me. So for years I was given these same three officers what's called prison meals every morning. It's a quarter pound of with cheese, I mean, every day. It's a quarter pound of with cheese and a s small fry. They were also my arresting officers. <laughs> so when they pulled up, they was like, they was baffled because I didn't get in trouble. And it's just like, Nero? And because they triggered off the silent alarm, mm -hmm. so they had the guns drawn. It's like, Nero, I don't know what's going on with you, but whatever it is, we can talk about it. Just, you know, relax, lay down or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I was so out of it because I had literally been up for three days. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I was going to be off the next day. So for all this to happen in the same day was like, you know, I was the brain, so my mind was gone. And uh, and, I'm, and my mindset is that, you know, you messed with my family, you mm -hmm. know, you messed with my mom and my, my fiance. So at the end of the day, you, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where when you have adrenaline and mm -hmm. you're angry, at the same time, you become you like think. the Incredible Hulk. You right. know, you can't think straight, things like that. And the uh, one officer, he was a huge guy. He had to be at least 260 pounds. And I laid down, and to taunt him, he put his knee on my neck, and just just a test of strength, I just kind of like pushed him off my neck. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just joking. You can, you can arrest me now. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, and I got a thing, I don't like to be uncomfortable. So when they arrest me, you know they put their hand, your mm -hmm. hands behind your back. And when the, by the time we got to the station, I, didn't, I had the, the cuffs in front of us like this, like, it's like, didn't you? Yeah, didn't, didn't you we just cuff you like? I just, you know, did oh, what I did. Oh, flexible. Uh, yeah, at that time, now I'm, I'm 43 <laughs> now, I can't do, <laughs> can't do the things that I used to. So fast forwarding through all of that, that's how I met my, my dad. Uh, he was actually a county sheriff, mm. and uh, he would come down to Gallo. He would sing down to Gallo. Everybody knew him, and um, just an amazing man. Um, of course, coming from Chicago, when you got a guy that's looking at you a certain type of way, you think, like, hey, hey, hey. That, I'm not that, with that. I ain't with that. But he kept looking at me, but when he looked at me, he wasn't just looking at me to look at me. You can tell he was looking through my soul. 
Mm. And I went mute for six months. I didn't talk to anybody for six months. I had wild hair. I can show y'all pictures that'll literally blow your mind. I had wild hair and my beard was crazy. You, I was unrecognizable. And he said to me that, he said, young man, he said, uh, God has assigned me to you. He said, I know you mad at him right now. He said, you, you might feel like, you know, the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you got to do this and do that and do whatever. He said, but uh, if you, once you touch down, he said, come find me. And he gave me, you know, the area to find him. And, um, and what ended up happening, now, this is really going to blow your mind. Because in the state of Illinois, like I said, you have to do 50% of the time. They gave me eight years. Uh, I believe at that time, uh, Bishop Larry Trotter was there. A couple of preachers around, the, you know, the city was there in support because I've always been a community figure, you know, um, I guess you say upright citizen, so to mm -hmm. speak. And I just had a great outpour of support. And then the judge said, uh, we understand and we appreciate everybody coming. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we let him go with a slap on the wrist, then that sends a, sets a bad presence for anybody to come, you know, do what he did behind him. So I'm sentencing him to eight years. Now, I had to do four. I got at my two-year mark. I just bought me a color TV and everything else. And they popped my cell Friday the 13th, July 2001. I said, Nero, pack your stuff. It's time to go home. I hesitated because, again, you know... <laughs> I, you know, I know I got two years left. My paperwork right. says I got two years left. But what ended up happening as I was processing all the information, you know, processing out, uh, I stole my ID card so I can always remember where I came from. Um, and then when I got to the last checkpoint, I asked, I said, hey, this is the last thing that I got to process out, right? Like, I ain't got nothing else, right? And the lady started laughing because I'm like, I need to know before I ask you what I'm going to ask you. So I asked her, I said, uh, can I ask you why they let me go? And she said, oh, that's an easy question because they were overcrowded by one and you were the lucky person. Mm. Wow. I don't believe in luck. Mm -mm. I believe in purpose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to go to the bad in order to find your purpose. Mm -hmm. And now that I found my purpose, I through, again, through that travesty, I found my triumphant moment to discover who I really am. You see what I'm saying? And that's the reason why as far as the campaign is concerned, that's why I firmly believe that I have the ability to win. I, being uh, one that's been into it with criminal, you know, activity or whatnot, how do you think that'll weigh in on you? Uh, exactly. You know, uh, running running for president. I absolutely love it, and I'll tell you why. It's because I'm going to be the most relatable candidate that this country has ever seen. Because one thing I can do, I can bring all heads together to make one purpose, one goal to actually manifest and do what it needs to do. Um, I, I like didn't to, even, Sorry, but I didn't even know you, you were allowed to, that you, <laughs> to, run, to, to run for president, being a person that has had a run in with the law. Okay, so let's, let's, let's cover a couple of myths. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest myths that I hear, of course, people that have read my story, they already know one of the things that, that gives me strength is my transparency. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to hide by telling you the truth. And it's not like it's not public record or, or somebody's not able to find it. Right. You know, someone can listen to this radio show today, come up with, he said X, Y, Z, where it's, going, it's literally written in the same pages of the book that I've written about my life. That's what the reason why I'm garnering so much support is because you have people that are in the political arena that is not transparent. Right. And what the people need more than anything is someone who has the ability to lead with transparency and accountability. I always hold my feet to the fire and hold myself to a different standard above everybody else. It doesn't make me perfect. It doesn't mean... Uh, that I'm the best candidate, it just means I'm the best transparent leader out of Noir because I don't really care for politics. So one of the myths that that people assume is that you can't run if you've had a if you have a background. Technically, as an, as a presidential candidate, the Constitution says that you only have to be two of three things: you have to be a United States uh, United States citizen mm -hmm. and at least 35 years of age. Mm -hmm. Or if you're not born here, you have to be here at least 14 years. That's the third part. So I fit the bill. That's why you have people that are running that is not qualified or justified to run. They just running just because you can. 
Mm-hmm. So there's nothing. So the second myth is you have to be married in order to run for the White because House. Because you're not married. I'm not married yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah, you said speak things yes, into existence, existence, right? So I, I, you know, I'm still single, but and no you know, children. No children. Okay. And I do have hopes to marry, hopefully before I win the White House. But if not, I'll you get married while I'm in the White House. <laughs> uh, have you look at it? I'm going to win the White Has House. Has anybody ever gotten married while they're in the White House? Not that I. I heard one, but I'm not sure of the name. And I actually just heard that today. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people that say a lot of things, and uh, you just have to be careful on the information that you intake when you're around me. So I don't know who this person might have been, but I can tell you what. If I tell you a duck can pull a truck, you better hook him up. But I don't know about that. You know? But, no. but no, you, um, so... How are you gonna uh, win the people over? You know, to get that, to get the push that you need for people to take you serious about running for president. Well, those that already know me know that I'm dead serious. Uh, and then once people get to meet me, their views on just the thought of a single black man with no children running for president is not even an idea. But after meeting, they understand my plight and they understand that what I say is what it is, and they understand that that. I've done my research, I've done my homework, and I'm still constantly doing my homework. Uh, the difference between me and other people, I'm a leader. I'm not a person that is that has a concern about uh, politics in whole, because politics in whole has been tainted by many, many, many hands. Mm-hmm. What this country needs is leadership. They need somebody that has the ability to, to bring out the best in the country. And this country needs healing more than anything because it, we come from various broken pieces. Who better uh, to mend those broken pieces than someone who was broken and destroyed and healed again? But, okay, but my thing is, I you agree. know, people always say that, okay, people who are running say a good game. They tell us everything we want. Mm-hmm. But once you get into office, it's a totally different... You don't hear from them no more. They yeah, just, just kind of so, disappear. So mm-hmm. how much... Okay, is a person in the office just a face, or are there other people pulling their strings? Say that one more time so I can make sure I answer the question correctly. Okay, is the person in the office um, just a face, as in the person that just, that's the president? Or are there people pulling his strings, telling him or her future reference um, what to do, the decisions to make? Okay, so now that I understand your question, I'll answer it this way. I've always understood the seat of the presidency, which of course is the highest office in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, The president is what's classified as the spokesperson for America. Right. um, And a liaison to other countries. But what happens that most people don't understand, there are some things using executive powers and executive privilege that he has the ability to do for all people that most people don't know that he has the ability to do. Now, that goes into a multiplicity of categories because everything is compartmentalized. Depending on what arena it is, that's why it's important to have a, uh, a solid vice president, a team. That, mm-hmm. a team, and to have the best people that is qualified to do this job, this job, this job. So you have someone over housing, have someone over education, you have someone over finance, someone over the, the, the military. So you have to find the best uh, uh, candidate to fit the bill, like Katanji Brown Jackson. Okay. She's beyond qualified, and you see what they attempted to do to her. She has the paperwork to prove mm-hmm. whatever and do whatever, but the problem in politics or in the political landscape is that you have people that is chasing after the money. There, You have a lot of bought people right. in politics. That's the difference with me versus them. I don't care. I've been presented with all types of financial offers to do certain things or whatever and to do that particular agenda that I have turned down. And I'm talking about it, it goes high and it goes low. Right. So there's, it isn't too many things. Again, I am from Chicago, so I've been homeless before. I've been incarcerated before. I've, I've been bankrupt before. So there's not too many things that I have that I will encounter that I have not encountered before. And the reason why I'd ask that question is because when you're running for president and you say all these good things, these things that we want to hear, mm-hmm. but once you get a seat, I just wanted to know how much control you had to try to really make those 
put it this happen. way there is a substantial amount of control that the president has now there is a council that that he, that he or she has that will give them give them guidance on how to govern which is well needed because right. you have to have you know counsel there's safety in a multitude of counsel so you have to have people that you can confer to that will keep you safe because you don't just make a decision for you you make a decision for the entire country right so that being said you have to understand you do have the power to make a decision for the country your word is the final say so unless it's something that have to go through congress or the house of representatives right so that being said there are many things that many presidents before me has the ability to do, including the current president, that they just simply consciously choose not to, not do. to do. And that's on them. So within good conscience, I have to do, so my platform, because I just posted it you know, online, you know, once elected, you know, into, once I win this thing, you know, I will do whatever is necessary to work with both people on both sides of the aisle to put the will of the people back in the hands of the people. And that's what we've lacked a, a mo you know, for a very long time. The will of the people have not been done for a long time. And somewhere around the time where we started to get voting rights is like the last endeavor that appeared that it was to cater to the will of the people. What is the will of the people? Basically, in my in my purview, it's something that will not necessarily infringe on your freedoms, uh, giving you back the freedom as a woman to dictate the outcome of your body. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any man should sit behind a closed door and say what a woman can and cannot do with their body unless it's harming someone else. Then I feel like that point, then maybe we should step in. But if that woman make a conscious decision, say that I want to have an abortion, that's their right. That should be their right to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, if she want to uh, get a Brazilian butt lift, that should be your ability to do that. That should be your liberty. Because you have to live with your, the consequences. Exactly. So it's your decision. So you have to live with the consequences of your decision, right or wrong. But, but that shouldn't be dictated by government saying that's true. that you can't do this with your body or that you can't have an abortion or you're doing this or doing that or whatever that's outside of their scope or guideline of things, which in my opinion makes absolutely no sense. Right, that's true. But the thing is that with some people, um, I think every case is different mm -hmm. um, because you have some people who are raped and do not want that child and they should be able to you exactly. know, have that abortion and so forth. But you have some people who will do it and then later on wish they didn't. You know what I mean? Just like I've heard like in Jamaica, like with marriages, mm -hmm. um, because here you have a high rate of divorce. A lot of people are getting divorced, but in Jamaica, and because um, a friend of mine had to go through this a couple of years ago, which I didn't know that they did this. But um, in order to get a divorce, you have to wait a whole year to actually finalize your divorce because so many people hot-headed I want a divorce yeah. let's do this and then later on whether remarry or give you time to repair the relationship exactly a mm -hmm. year before you can actually and I, and I love that fact you know what I mean because I'm like if the United States had that then the rate probably wouldn't be as high as it is right now but great point so at the end of the day that's still a conscious decision that mm -hmm. you should have the ability to decide on your own now if you have an abortion and you regret it a year later, that's on you. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be that as me being the person that is running the government that says that you cannot. Right. I feel like that takes away your right to choose. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So that's a big difference. So running a country that way to tell women of a country that they can't have an abortion versus an individual making a conscious decision for herself that she wants to have an abortion and regret it later, that's a personal call. Mm -hmm. And that's what I don't want to do. I don't want to take away your personal liberties because again, I'm a man. My thought is, I don't want to do what y'all do. <laughs> so I look at my mom as a, a prime example. She had three boys and she spent most of her adult life as a mother single. But she might have had some regrets. I don't know if she did. She didn't, you know, convey that message to me. But she's very proud of us. You know, the good and the bad, she supported us. She corrected us when she was wrong, and she supported us when we was right. But when it's all said and done and the smoke clear, she did what she had to do as a mother. 
there's not a lot of there's there's are some women in the United States that don't have the mental fortitude to raise children by themselves. Right. So it may lead to that, or it may be a byproduct of rape that they don't want to live with that that consciousness exactly. to know that this man you know has done what they did and now and she's, I have to look at this child every day and remember that exactly. So I've heard it from again I've heard it from every single mm-hmm. angle. Um, matter of fact, I'll tell you there was a this was years ago. I want to say about fifteen years ago there was an eleven year old. A black young lady that was standing on the corner bus stop. It had to be, I want to say, 63rd Street. Waiting on the corner was pregnant with twins. Mm. And that was a byproduct of her father raping her. So, of course, I had to take the bus at the time. So, we had an opportunity to talk. But one thing about it, in leadership, I've, I've learned that one of the best ways to understand the will of the people is to listen to the people. Right. And I've had an opportunity low or high to listen to people and listen to what people actually want. Now, everybody doesn't know exactly what they want at yeah. times, and but the different. collective, absolutely, the collective, you get to hear the things that make it possible to uh, bring people together to unite for this cause or that cause. So overall, I feel like you should have your freedoms to do what you need to do that is beneficial for your own life. My job and responsibility as one who is seeking the highest office in this land to do what is beneficial to keep everyone safe, to make sure that we are moving, uh, I guess you say one band, one sound, so to speak, uh, and that we're functional um, and that we can work with everybody on both sides of the aisle. And it's not just the Democrats or the Republic, you know, the Republicans. We're looking at American citizens. My job is, to, as a public servant, is to serve the public. Okay. Who's who's gonna? Uh, do you know who you're gonna run with yet, or you hadn't announced it? Or so the actual official announcement is in December. Um, who you you have I, any people in mind? I, I got a couple <laughs> people, but I don't I don't want to share that just yet. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. On, go on and just tell me what's in the water or what's in the pizza. Or the, the, <laughs> the, you know what's going on with you? You had Kanye from down here. He was like, well, yeah. Let's be real for a minute. I'm just sitting back thinking. I th- I'm a thinker. I mean, he he ran for president. Uh, uh, he said in mm. 2020 he would run. Now you you from Chicago? You're gonna run? You know. Um, what no Obama and Michelle and them down here when they decided they was gonna take off running too? This is true. So everybody down here, we can't move to, unless I might want to run for president too. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I'll say this in reference to that. Uh, as we know, Obama and his family is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kanye is a great in his arena. Um, I'm great in my arena. I stay, I stay in my lane. Uh, and the thing that makes every single individual different is that, and this is to your credit earlier when you made this statement as far as what sets you apart. Right. So I'm a firm believer that whatever you put out there is going to do one or two things. Hold on. That's not mine. I'm so sorry. That's me. That's okay. Yeah, uh, you just showed that I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that might have been Darrell ice cream. <laughs> um, but what separates me from everybody else, and the same thing that separated Obama, we were true to power, we were true to form. Uh, as they say, what's in the dark always come to light. And the difference with me, everything about me, I presented my darkness to the light, so you don't have to go looking for it. You know, if you find something about my life that I don't already know about, then let me know, then I'll put that in the book too. Um, but there is nothing that is hidden with me. You know, when I was broke, I was broke. Uh, when I was on top of the world, I was on top of the world. Whatever the, my situation was, and that's what makes me the most relatable candidate. But that doesn't matter. You know, they're still going to take it and twist it and turn it. Just like I'm okay with, that. with, with, with Obama, everybody knew where he was born, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that became such a big yeah. issue. I'm completely okay with that because people are going to do what they're going to do in, in, you know, at the end of the what day. What if one of those older uh, girlfriends you had uh, come <laughs> out with a child and say she want to you know, say that you're the father. You know, there are some people out here, man. Uh, well, <laughs> you know. We're going to have to get a DNA test, if, man. If that happened, you know, of course I would want a, a DNA test. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as I know, I don't have any out there. <laughs> uh, but if I do, because, I mean, you know, this is America, right? Anything is possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I will own up to my responsibility. 
And the only thing I would say at that point is why, because I'm, I've been a public figure for a while, I'm easily accessible. Why wait to then to yeah, that, share that? Because you're seeking you know. a higher yeah, office. Yeah, it's more, it's well, more, it's more, it's better at yeah, that level. It, it probably is better. <laughs> I, I actually just recently had someone to tell me that uh, a great president always have at least one good scandal. Uh, <laughs> you know, if it ain't a brown suit, it's a baby baby's mother. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But uh, it is what it is. But again, you're still talking about mental fortitude to be able to handle whatever pressures that come. And again, you can't break somebody who's already been destroyed. I've mm -hmm. been through the worst, so there's nothing really that you can do to me that I haven't already done to myself. Uh, you can consider consider me the uh, political Eminem. Uh, Eminem has uh, an ability to lay out his issues before you and if i give you this there's nothing you can do because i just gave you the tools to i guess you say dissect me or whatever but what you do is you literally take the strength or the power out of their hands because you maintain control that way and if i tell you the truth and you find out that that's the truth there's nothing you can say well what about uh yeah well I i'd love to see you make that office man you'd be the third black president bill clinton then <laughs> obama then you <laughs> You know what I'm saying? This is going to be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, I love it. And it, time always tell. Time always tell the type of individual that you have, uh, whether now or later. And the fact is, I love that this is on record because everything that I say aligns. Um, I love questions where it allows me to be transparent and open to who I am mm -hmm. uh, and who I'm going to be. Uh, because like I said, you have to take the good and the bad uh, at the end of the day. And that's why... I feel like I'm the only person that can bring this country to the arena where we can actually start healing. Because as a national motivational speaker, I tell people all the time that no matter where you are in your life, your life is not beyond repair. And whatever I say, I mean it. And I can back it up with action. Um, and the fact of the matter is that a lot of people are broken. And they think they're stuck right where they are. Mm -hmm. But I'm literally using the transparency of my life to not only do this campaign, but to also show people that you can take a messed up life and change it anytime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. And if the American people can see that and they can see the whole process of this happening. And as I become more into the presidency in this campaign and candidacy, the whole nine yards, it will literally strike fire, in my opinion, and it will literally change the face of this nation in an upward fashion. I seek to not only inspire, but to, to be transformative. I don't want to just talk to people. I want to show them what I'm talking about. You know, and that requires action. It's going to take, you know, uh, I was told if, if what you're seeking to do doesn't require the help of other people, it's not big enough. Mm -hmm. And this is the biggest and largest thing that I've ever done in my life. And it's not something that I even want to do. It's something that I have to do. Because I'm not going to sit there and wait for someone else to, you know, put a little fire up under their tail and say, let me do what I know best to do. You see people, it's like people with money. There are people who have money that can change the trajectory of homelessness in this country, but choose to spend mm -hmm. it on buying spaceships and mm -hmm. uh, other things that little tinker toys while you sit here get uh, 500,000 homeless people in the United States that don't have a place a shelter that put you know over their head or food or you know food to eat or whatever even those that were in jail they were satisfied they would come back to jail because they had three hots in the car that's right mm -hmm. so at the end of the day if we have the ability to do something then we do it Statistically, they say men live to be uh, 60, I think it's either 69 years old or 79 years old. So with the second half of my life, I'm going to spend that time trying to change the world. Do you, um, what, what do you think about COVID and, and when that crisis hit, uh, how would you have handled that if you would have been in position to deal with it? Honestly, I don't, well, first thing I would have did, one thing I would not have done, I would not have changed uh, President Obama's uh, institution that he had in, in place to, to catch or be preventive with the different diseases that was in the world. Because one of the first things Trump did in office just to spite him was to uh, disband that functionality of the government. And if that was still in place, he put it in place to be preventive so we wouldn't have had a situation similar to COVID. And as an immediate byproduct, we see what happened mm -hmm. you know, with that scenario. So I will actually reenact that program 
and put a little bit more dollars behind it to make sure that this never happens again, or at least try to prevent it as much as we possibly can. I would be pro- rather be I want to be proactive rather uh, rather than reactive, uh, because the COVID scenario, everything was reactionary. And they were doing the best that they could with the misinformation that was out there stemming directly from the highest office and not taking that seat seriously enough to know that it affects every American citizen. And because you're in a cushy seat, that don't mean your job is done because you made it or that you've arrived. Your job is to protect, you know, and to serve our country. It ain't just the communities. We have to service every single community. Every community needs something. And it's my job to find out what those needs are and to at least meet you halfway. Man, wow, thank you so much, man. This is great. Andre Nero is Is, in the building. Is there any other issues that you see that have been mishandled over the time that you think that you (laughs) would, as soon as you get in there, you say, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to change this. So there are a couple of things that I will speak about. Um, I would like to, okay, so let me disclose this information. My, okay. my uncle was a Chicago police sergeant. Mm-hmm. So again, I, I told you there's no problem that does not have a solution. Um, because I understand it from every angle, from a street level, from a legal level, political level, however you want to look at it. Um, I know one of the biggest things for a police officer is to, number one, keep the streets safe within, within your means. Uh, but every officer is not on the same bandwidth. So you have issues that we've had in the community for decades, centuries even. Um, but I also know that defunding the police is not necessarily the best route to go. However, I do feel that it is necessary and beneficial to help both the citizen and the officer to reallocate funds uh, that public servants have or public safety officials have to make sure that we have better resources within our community so we can also monitor ourselves without having the influx of officers that put their life on the line daily to have those different issues when we can actually help ourselves at the same time. Wow. And better train officers dealing with people of other ethnicities. Well, (laughs) I don't want to get it twisted Mm -hmm. because officers have great training in this great country of America. Okay. They consciously choose when that training is applicable. Okay. That's all I say on that one. Wow. Andre Nero, President Andre Nero, President elect Andre Nero, man. Thank you so much for coming on Boss Talk. Thank you for having me. Did did you have something else? Did we touch every subject? Except for the fact that I'm running independent. Oh, you running independent. You got that, a bag that's, of money. That's exactly what so I was going to ask. So you got a bag of money. You got a lot of money to run independent. You got to put that money up. Well, uh, absolutely. So I know. of course I'm going to be spending a lot of money out of pocket, but I'm sure I'm, I'm going to have a community or communities that will also um, support my support. endeavor. Yeah, because I was wondering, how are you going to reach the masses as much as, yes, we have our viewers or listeners, but um, how can everyone know you and fall in love with you so they can vote for you? Uh, well, for starters, we can lead them to my social media if that's okay. Correct. With that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, what, what? So, of course, you know, my last name is Nero and my mm-hmm. social media handle is America's Got Nero. I just was on it. I, I, I think that's catchy. Yeah. We, we got we, we to we definitely got to drive that for us. Because the Nero almost sound like Nemo. <laughs> 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 no, so, so man, uh, you, you got something? Um, yeah, but every time you ask me that, it but it also cool. rhymes with hero too, and, and which which is a great segue there you go. to uh, me winning the uh, NWCP Image Award, hometown that. champion for stopping an armed robbery. You stopped wow. armed robbery? I did with my Tell bare us. hands. Uh, well, this you, guy I, was. It was you said he said earlier hands. that he has hands now. Well, where were y'all? I did. At? I did. <laughs> um, I don't want to take you. No, I'll say uh, we was actually at an Arby's. Uh, Arby's. It was at an Arby's. Now, Arby's still exists for those of you that in had Chicago? questions. No, it was in Atlanta. Okay, why does uh, this sound, almost sound like, you know, coming to America when he was in there and they came into in McDonald's? <laughs> uh, I've heard that plenty of times as well. Um, um, 
So this was, you know, me and my uh, my girlfriend at the time, mm -hmm. uh, we had just walked into an Arby's. We were both, you know, extremely hungry. And Arby's is not something that we would normally do, uh, but we needed something fast. And that's where the hunger pain started hitting the most. And we stopped there within uh, not even five minutes. It was a it was an older black lady uh, that was taking our order. You know, one of the, the, the mamas, you know, hey, baby, how you doing? You know. Uh, one of those down south mamas, and she was real uh, welcoming, things like that. And something was off when we went to go sit down, you know, sit down or whatever, because this guy, you know, unfortunately he was black, you know, and she was using that, that southern uh, hospitality, and all of a sudden she just went mute, and she froze, and I knew something was happening at that point. Uh, being from the great city of Chicago, we know what those points are, so it was time to spring into action, and um, I, I definitely tried to cross face him. Wow. Um, and I took him down the gun, you know, uh, flew in the air over the counter, and I tried mm. to break every bone in his body. Wow. wow. Yeah, he was the Buckhead Bandit. Uh, the police told me that he had robbed 36 locations in 30 days. And they couldn't get him. Oh, and they and couldn't get him. Them. And when they, when they got hold of him, his arm was, <laughs> was stuck in their head. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's something else. Did the city recognize you for that? They did. Mm -hmm. And I got free Arby's for life at, at, at that location. Wow. Yes, sir. Free Arby's, wow. man. Just at, at that, that location. location. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. another thing that I wanted to touch on, um, because right now we're suffering from a high rate of school shootings or shootings in, in, for kids. Because in Dallas, we just had that shooting oh God, as yes. well. You know, that yes. it was very devastating. And it's like every time you turn around, something pops up again. Because I know that, again, in Dallas, um, I saw it on the news. Um, in Duncanville, they found a man who was actually heading towards a camp where a lot of kids were there, but luckily they caught him before he actually got there. But how can we reduce all of that in all these different states and make this not happen again? I know they blame it on the guns, NRA and all of that, so how can we really? So here's just one strong idea, and again, everybody doesn't have to subscribe to it, but we have had a substantial amount of gun violent cases, gun, right. you know, gun cases, uh, especially when it come down to the schools, which mm -hmm. is a very sensitive area for parents, especially. Um, and nobody want to see their child gunned down, especially not at school, school, because that's supposed to be your safe haven. You mm -hmm. send your child at the very least of things you, you know, once your child walk away and they're in the, the perimeters of, of school, you thinking safety. Um, but my heart grieves for every parent that has lost a child due to gun violence. Yes. And then when you add gun violence in a school, in school. it makes it worse. Uh, so that's a different type of emotional damage that I would never want to. And that's the only reason why I'm glad I don't have children. Because, you know, I would, I, I'm not sure how I would respond as a parent. Uh, so one of my things that I would love to introduce is, and it, you know, some people may deem it as, um, confining, but since we since COVID, we have introduced a lot of virtual worlds. So I think it would be beneficial to bring our children to the virtual classroom, where at least you're in the safety of your own home, and you don't have to worry about a gunman taking out multiple kids at one time. And it's I, I hate to have to say this, but for them to target schools, and I want you to look at it at the level that we're at now. So let's say. Once we do get to the 2024 presidential elections, what happens in between the time from now to then? All right. How many more children will we lose if we don't transition to something that's more productive and safe for our families, for our children? Uh, and I know sometimes we might have to, you know, a lot of people are now working from home, which is it statistically it shows that the people are more productive at home. But have the choice to choose, okay, they have do the I choice. want my child to be virtual so, or because... Yeah. With COVID and being a mother, because I remember with COVID, I loved it. I loved my children being at home because actually they did better at home than, and my daughter is a straight A student, 95 and up, up. my son, A, Bs, but when he was at home, he was all A's. So, um, but not every parent is lucky like that. Some kids don't do well, mm -hmm. but to be able to have that choice, but the school system will say, well, I don't have teachers who can designate to just this or just to that. So 
just to employ more teachers to have so more teachers I definitely think that. we should employ more more teachers and definitely get them acclimated to the virtual world and of course have some options and I think it should be reduced to just like a select group uh, and maybe grades might have something to do with maybe mm-hmm. kids that may need a little extra attention are uh, just I went to Thornridge High School and you know I went three years as a freshman because I didn't know I had ADHD combined mm-hmm. uh, so I had to find that in the worst possible way so like I said I use these experiences for people to start waking up to a different ideology that we look at things for what it is because a lot of times we don't really know. So if we have the test and if we have the scoring, we have all the different things to identify what type of child we're dealing with and how they learn, then I think we can put them in the categories that we need to put them in so they can get the proper education. Exactly. And I think COVID helped that in so many different ways because when I say help, you know, sorry for all the people that we actually lost because of COVID, but COVID helped in a lot of ways where um, technology-wise, everything went virtual. We didn't know we had that ability to have all of these kids go virtual. Absolutely. So that opened that gap for that. And even mm-hmm. for people who we lost before COVID, you didn't have people streaming funerals on social media and stuff like that, where people who weren't able to fly. Graduation. People mm-hmm. weren't able to make it. Now everybody can see that person, you know, say farewell to them, be happy for that person who is graduating, getting married, just all of that. Before that, we, didn't, we, we weren't doing that. Mm-hmm. So the, it has its pros and cons. Absolutely. Just the same as, as my, my life. Like I said, with, with travesty, you can also have time mm-hmm. depending on your per, per, you know perspective on life. Um, so like I said, we have to introduce something new. And that's why, especially, I and I'll make this statement, the whole George Floyd situation right. plus COVID introduced the world to something that we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. We always knew it was there, but until you actually made people watch this and have to deal with that, now we have what we have today. So with leadership changing as a byproduct of the whole George Floyd scenario, matter of fact, if I can be completely honest, I do not think that we'll have the vice president if it wasn't for the George Floyd situation. Mm-hmm. Um, because we know that there are a certain group of Americans that doesn't necessarily like certain kinds to hold certain positions. Right. So at the end of the day, now that things are shifting, we have to be able to have leadership that have the ability to shift with the with shift. Mm-hmm. So, and that's where I come in. And that's why the opportunity now has presented itself where I can stand out among, amongst anybody else that's running because I have the experience and the leadership and the fortitude to do what is necessary uh, to make sure this country goes in the right direction. And the last topic I want to touch on, and then that would be it, was um, driving around Chicago, and maybe, you know, we're staying in downtown area. I love the fact that I don't see any homeless people just around downtown. It's very clean, we, you know, but going through other cities, you see a lot of that, you know, LA, Dallas, you know, certain places, you see a lot of that. How can we reduce that? So I'll, I'm an out-the-box type of thinker. Uh, I'm a left-handed divergent thinker. So I think about things that most people would naturally think of. Uh, I told y'all earlier that I actually begged to be in the gang and they rejected me. Right. Uh, but in growing up, I learned to use certain things to be um, instrumental in growth. So one thing I would love to do is because, again, we also talked about lack of father figures and things like mm-hmm. that. So putting those things together, I think it's very beneficial to utilize uh, uncanny leadership. Let me explain what I mean by that. You have uh, the uncanny or the unlikely leader in those who were in gangs uh, because those who are now doing things positive when they were doing things negative understand it from both sides. Mm-hmm. So if you have a leader who was able to unify everybody together to start changing that entire trajectory because people that's in the street listen to people that's from the street right people that's in education listen to people that's in education so if you have different leaders that was once a part of this that is now doing this and you put those people together now you can go back to that those same communities and have such a camaraderie that this country has never seen before people that are uh, Kanye West uh, he attempted to dibble in politics Mm -hmm. but this ain't his lane but he's good at partnering with drake and other artists to do you know beneficial things that you know for the community to Mm -hmm. assist in his capacity 
So if you are able to identify uh, my my uh, my gifting is identifying other Strength. leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, I so I can okay. So I actually discovered something with McDonald's. I was the person who created putting your aces in your place in their places. Mm -hmm. So I realized how to to. Uh, to increase profitability by putting the right person. If you're good at grilling and cooking, I don't want you on the register. But if you're good at counting money, you look good, I'm putting you on the register. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And putting those two things together makes the whole job function effectively. Right. So if you have people that are gifted in their abilities and they once did this and they now how to do this and, and, and translate from negative to positive, I believe in using those people that were uh, unlikely to hold particular positions mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, not saying, not necessarily in an official capacity, depending on the job functionality. But if it's something that can actually affect masses, and this is something that, that they affected masses negatively, they can also do that positively. Right. And I have an ability to hone in on those skills and figure out a way to use those skills for positive, for good, for everybody. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. I, 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 I'm telling you, dude, I was thinking about things when you were talking. Um, you mentioned uh, Kanye West. Um, <clears throat> but you got to think about the entertainers and stuff. They are very influential. I know uh, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, uh, Mr. Sean Combs, whatever you want to call yourself yeah. these days. He was uh, at church Sunday. Yeah, he's one of those guys that always uh, uh, tell you to go out and vote. No, he don't tell you to vote for it, but he always push a big vote mm -hmm. campaign. Uh, how do you get these guys to, to I mean you, you know that they're being attacked in certain ways in their own on you know in their own uh, space they, they feel like a lot of times they're targeted a lot of these uh, you got some of them that are dying you know um, what solution do you have for these entertainers who are very impactful and when it comes to a lot of situations as you spoke on earlier you know so I don't actually have a solution for that yet <laughs> I've been working on one, but I, I'm not comfortable enough to say that I have a finite solution. Yeah. But me and my team have been working on some things or, or trying to beta test some things that could actually work. Because one thing, you know, I have a security background. So when it's all said and done, my thing is I want everybody safe. Uh, and it doesn't matter who you are. You can be white, brown, black, yellow, green. Uh, my job is to make sure that me and mine is safe. And as the president of the United States of America, me and mine is the United States of America. So my job is to make sure every single individual is as safe as humanly possible. That is within my power. And as having executive uh, privileges, I have the ability to do things other people cannot do. Uh, and I want to exercise those abilities to make sure that we as you know, United States citizens feel like United States citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I do have a, we do have a couple things that's in the work and, you know, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to come back on another, you know, session with you guys. Uh, and then hopefully at that time we'll have uh, a good game plan as to how we want to move forward with that. And or we might just roll that out in the presidential rollout uh, as well, because I got some other things that would be beneficial as well. Uh, and I'll tell you about that as well. Um, uh, I would love to have, because disproportionately we have a lot of black men uh, especially that is locked up mm -hmm. um, without good ground I'll just say that yeah, exactly. and we have some individuals that should be home with their families um, I want to actually execute a program that will allow us the opportunity to pay for uh, up to but not limited to 5,000 people's backgrounds being removed expunged and or sealed so I think that'd be a good start. It's not just about you know voting. Um, in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, in 2008, I actually did an ex-offender awareness day march, which they tried to shut down because they wasn't they didn't understand that when you have one person locked up, you have a hundred people locked up mm -hmm. because that person has a family, mm -hmm. and if you have people that are in government that don't have anybody locked up, they don't understand. And so my job was to get them to understand if you have people in a position to cause that level of understanding from a federal and state and local level, then we can all do our jobs effectively and then the citizens thereof can feel safe. 
And that's the safety is not just with physical safety, but you got to have financial safety. You have to have emotional support and safety. Um, you know, you have people that experience all types of uh, wickedness in this land. Um, so you have to make it multidimensional so you can have something for everybody, so to speak. Um, I go to, I now go to Potter's house with Bishop T.D. Jakes. Uh, and one of the things I loved in one of his orientation videos, he said, no matter who you are, there is something for everyone. Mm -hmm. And with that mindset, I have to have something for everyone because it's not just black, it's not just white, it's not just Asian. You have a nation full of people that has a very diverse background that you have to work uh, have everybody to work together in synchrony. And the only way we're going to move forward, America is at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes down to ratings. Like, it's, it's rated one of the worst countries in the world. Mm -hmm. But yet we have... Uh, a everybody supreme. who wants to live here. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you know, we, we, have, we have some things that we're really working on to make some, make some magic happen in this country. And like I said, I don't think nobody else can do it but me. Hey, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, we're going to definitely hold you to it. Hold my feet to the fire. <laughs> Accountability is big. If you pass, God forbid, but, you know, you passed away, how would you want this country to remember you? Like, what do you want to leave in remembrance for this country? My legacy I would want to leave is that this is a person who went from a very tragic life to triumphant and did everything in his power to make it fair for everybody. That's what I would want my legacy to be. Because if I never have children, as far as I know, I don't have any. If I never have any, at this, you know, uh, moving forward, America in so many ways will be my legacy, right. my children. And I would want to leave everybody to be realistically free. Mm -hmm. And at this point, that's not where we are. Uh, are we doing top three? No. Uh, top three presidents of all time? We can do that. Top three presidents of all time. And that question is for me. Yes, sir. Um, I will say JFK. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Why? He's number one. Because if he was still alive, he would have done what I'm getting ready to do. Okay. He was actually for the people that based on my research and studies, um, he actually cared about everybody and wanted to see everybody win. Everybody doesn't have that heart that he has and that I have. Uh, you have a lot of people that will stand in your face and say, I love you. And they want to, you know, they yeah, don't, you they know. Don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I stand in your face and I tell you that I love you, I mean that with every fiber of my being. And that love is that covers everything because I don't care what you've done. I only care where you are and where you're going. That's my job is to focus on where you are today and where we where you need to go and try to give you the tools you need to be a successful. And I feel like he would have been the one to actually what everything that I, I plan on doing and everything that I will do. I feel like he would have been the first one to do just that. And, number and two. then number two, uh, you have, I will say Obama. Okay. And um, why? Be, well, first of all, I, I will say him as number two is because he was able to lay, lay the foundation for me. Okay. And because if he, if he hadn't come before me, I wouldn't actually have this opportunity mm -hmm. because nobody would believe that I would be able to do it. I right. couldn't be the first, but I can definitely be the next. Yes and do it even better. So I'm grateful for him <laughs> to do that. And plus from him being from here, it makes it even better. Right. Uh, number three? Number three is a tough one. Always is. Um, well, I'll just say George Washington hmm. because he was the first and only independent in, until me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man, here we go. Thank you. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate me. you. Hopefully we can uh, uh, you, you know, get back with you before the the presidency you know yes. uh 2024 is a that's a that's yeah. a pretty good ways away less than 900 days away oh, he's counting, so, he counting now yeah, that's right so we're gonna we're yeah. gonna get there man thank you so much for coming on the show we love you yes and we love you as well and we mean it we do and it's been another <laughs> great segment of boss talk 101 where the bosses talk and we're out